In this video, we'll look at how some of these concepts can be applied to graphs. This is a complex subject, so we'll only give a very high-level overview without going into too many details. Graphs are an even more versatile format for capturing knowledge than matrices and tensors. Many of the most interesting datasets take the forms of graphs. For instance, social graphs, where the nodes are people, and the links between them indicate that these people know each other, work together, or are friends. Protein interaction graphs, where the nodes are proteins in cells, and the links indicate that these proteins interact in a meaningful way. Traffic networks, where the links are roads and the nodes are intersections. Or knowledge graphs, which capture a variety of heterogeneous knowledge, of which we'll see an example later. The first machine learning task on graphs that we'll look at is link prediction. In link prediction, we assume that the graph is incomplete, that is, we have all the nodes, but we don't have all the links, and we want to predict which links that don't currently exist in the graph might be true as well. For instance, which two people should be friends, or which two proteins may have an as yet undiscovered interaction. And we can see recommendation as a particular instance of the link prediction problem. Here, the graph is bipartite. We have two different types of nodes, users and movies, and the links are always from one type to another. In general link prediction, the graph may not be bipartite, so we just learn a single embedding matrix for all of our nodes. We can then compute a score for the likelihood of a link existing in the graph between nodes i and j with the dot product, as we did before. We learn the embeddings to maximize the score for the known links, as we did for the recommender system, and we can then compute the dot product to predict new links. In short, we apply the principle of matrix factorization to the adjacency matrix of a graph. And we can then use all of the tricks from the first two videos to optimize our embeddings for the nodes. Knowledge graphs are graphs where the nodes represent concepts or entities, and links are labeled with a relation. Here, for instance, we don't just have users and movies. We also have directors and gender. It's a bit like a lot of different recommendation tasks all rolled into one. Note in this case how the knowledge of different relations can potentially help our predictions of other relations. For instance, knowing that John in this graph likes Memento, and that Memento is directed by Christopher Nolan, may allow us to conclude that John might like Inception as well. And we can extend a link prediction method to knowledge graphs. There are many ways to do this, but a very simple approach is to learn node embeddings as we did before, but to also learn a separate embedding for every different relation type. So in this graph, we have three types of relations. So we add a small matrix containing three embedding vectors for the three different types of relations. We can then extend the idea of using the dot product as a score function by using a kind of three-way dot product. This looks complicated, but it's essentially just element-wise multiplying three vectors together and summing over the resulting vector just like we do with two vectors when we compute a dot product. So, for a particular node i, a relation r, and another node j, to predict whether there's a link between i and j of the type r, we look up these three embeddings, and we compute the three-way dot product, and the higher that three-way dot product is, the more likely there is to be a link. Like the previous methods, this is also a decomposition, but not of a matrix, but of a three-tensor. Into the product, of the relation embeddings, the node embeddings, and the node embeddings again. So that's link prediction. Another machine learning task we can do on graphs is node classification. Here we are given a graph, and for each node in the graph, we are given a label. And the label is what we want to predict. We could use this, for instance, for fraud prediction, where the nodes are people and the links are financial transactions, and some of these people are engaged in fraudulent behavior. We could use it for fake news detection, where the nodes are websites on the internet and the links are hyperlinks between these websites. Or we could use it for genre prediction, where the nodes are users and movies as before, and the links are ratings. But this time we're not trying to predict missing ratings, but we're trying to predict properties of those nodes that represent movies. If we have vector embeddings for our nodes, then we can use those in a regular classifier. But the question is, how do we get those embeddings, and how do we ensure they capture the required information. 
we can't just assign node embeddings like before and apply gradient descent on the classification loss, because that would ignore the graph structure entirely and would train each embedding in isolation to produce a particular classification. We wouldn't generalize between nodes. The principle we will be using to refine our embeddings is that of mixing embeddings together. To develop our intuition, imagine that we assign all nodes random three-dimensional embeddings with values between 0 and 1. For the purposes of visualization, we can then interpret these as RGB colors. We start with random embeddings, an entirely random color per node. We then apply a mixing step. We replace each node color by the mixture, the average of itself and its direct neighbors. In the first step, the embeddings represent nothing but identity. Each node has its own unique color. After one mixing step, however, the node embeddings express something about the local graph neighborhood. A node that is close to many purple nodes will become slightly more purple itself. After many mixing steps, all nodes will have the same embedding, expressing only information about the entire graph. Somewhere in between, we find a sweet spot, where the embeddings express the node identity, but also the structure of the local graph neighborhood. The simplest way to mix node embeddings is just to make the new node embedding the sum or average of all the embeddings of its neighbors. We can achieve this kind of mixing by multiplying the embedding vector by the adjacency matrix. This results in a new embedding vector that is the sum of the embeddings of the neighboring nodes. We also add self loops for every node so that the current embedding stays part of the sum. This is equivalent to adding the identity matrix to the adjacency matrix. Now, if we sum like this, multiplying by the plain adjacency matrix, the embedding will blow up with every mixing step. If we add together the embeddings of three neighbors, on average, the new embedding will be three times as big. In order to control for this, we need to normalize the adjacency matrix. If we row normalize, then the new embeddings, then the new embeddings are the averages over all the neighbors. We can also use symmetric normalization, which leads to a slightly different type of mixing, but this only works on undirected graphs, so we won't go into it here. And this is the basic principle used in graph convolutional networks. The word convolution here is used because they were inspired by image convolutions, but the connection is loose, so it's best not to read too much into it. The idea is that we start with some node embeddings, we call that N0. We compute a new embedding for each node, which is the average of its neighbor's embeddings, and we can compute this easily by multiplying by the adjacency matrix. And here we assume A has the self loops included and has been normalized. And we then apply a fully connected neural network layer to each node embedding independently. And this gives us a new set of embeddings N1. We've used a sigmoid activation here, but we can also use a ReLU activation or a linear activation. What works best depends on the data. And we can treat this as one graph convolutional layer. If we add multiple layers together, our network looks like this. And after k of these layers, the embedding mixes in information from k hops away from the current node. The output O is a matrix in which each column represents one of our nodes, based on both the initial embedding N0 and the local network structure. We can then use these representations O to perform our classification. This is probably a bit abstract, so let's go through it step by step. We are given a graph structure, shown at the bottom, and for some or all of the nodes, we are given target labels, in this case, positive and negative classes. We start by assigning each node an initial embedding vector. We then perform a mixing step, where we average together the embedding vectors of all the neighboring nodes, which gives us for each node a new embedding vector, that is a mixture of itself and its neighbors. We then apply a fully connected layer with a weight matrix and a bias vector to each of these vectors separately. And we can give this a sigmoid ReLU or linear activation. So here there is no information being propagated over the graph or being mixed between nodes, but there is a nonlinear transformation happening. And the result of this is the output of the first layer, which are our node representations N1. We add another convolution layer so we average over the neighbors again, and we apply another fully connected layer with another set of weights, V and C. But this time we ensure that the output dimension is the same as the number of classes, in this case two. 
So we get output vectors of dimensionality 2, and we apply a softmax activation so that they become probability vectors. And this allows us to interpret the values of these vectors as the probability of the positive class and the probability of the negative class. In other words, we have now produced a classification for every node in our network. We can compare these to our target labels to give us a logarithmic loss, which we sum over all the nodes and backpropagate. And in that backpropagation, we train both the parameters of our fully connected layers, V, W, B, and C, and the values of our initial node embeddings, N0. And this mixing trick works for link prediction too. We simply apply a few GCN layers to mix up our embeddings a little, and then use them to predict our adjacency matrix. We compare these predictions to our training data, and we backpropagate the loss to train both the initial embeddings, N0, and the parameters of our GCN layers. So that, so that, in a nutshell, is the graph convolutional network. We should note that depth here is a problem. We usually cannot train these networks for more than two layers. High connectivity diffuses the information too much. They usually need to be trained full batch. There is no straightforward way to break up the graph into mini batches. And there is no way to make the pooling selective. In image convolutions, we saw that each neighboring pixel we saw that each neighboring pixel receives a different weight. Here, that is not the case. All neighbors are mixed equally before the weights are applied, and the weights do not affect which of the neighbors receive attention. So there we have it. A quick high-level overview of how machine learning on graphs is often done. These explanations are probably not enough to help you understand the finer details, but they hopefully give you enough of a general idea so that if you ever run into a problem like this, you know where to start your research. In the next and final video in this lecture, we'll look back at all of these models and we'll discuss some of the finer points required to validate performance correctly on embedding models.